For generations, humans have been fascinated by the stars. With the night sky allowing people to navigate around the globe. With time, scientists known as astronomers have learnt to look to the stars to tell them about the history of the universe, examining their light to learn about how everything came to be. From galaxies to planets, from black holes to life on Earth. You too can be an astronomer simply by using your remarkable eyes. We can collect the light given out by stars made millions of years ago simply by staring into the night sky and gazing at a myriad of stars that allow us to see back in time. But professional astronomers often want to see fainter objects in space that their eyes alone can't pick out. Which is why they use scientific instruments to help gather more light. Whilst this could be as simple as a pair of binoculars, they commonly use telescopes. Telescopes are made up of lenses and mirrors to help focus the light collected from space into a clear image. Crucially, they also have large apertures, the opening through which the light can pass, to collect much more light. This is like boosting the much smaller advantage you get when your pupils dilate in the dark to allow you to see better in low light conditions. By collecting more light, dim things become visible and more features can be seen. The image that's collected can be seen through the eyepiece on some telescopes or on an imaging sensor, which could be a digital camera. Without the help of a digital camera, our eyes alone can only collect light for a fraction of a second before a signal is sent to the brain, meaning it's very hard for us to see dim objects in the night sky. The advantage of using a camera on a telescope is that the sensor within the camera can collect light for longer before it's sent to the camera's processor to make an image. This helps scientists to see the very faintest of objects in the night sky and learn more about our universe. One of these scientists is Sam Jackson, who uses the telescopes to study asteroids. I'm currently two thirds of the way up Mount Tady in Tenerife at the Observatorio del Tedi, one of the best astronomical observing sites in the world. In front of me are the telescopes Pirate and Coast, part of the Open Science Observatories owned and operated by the Open University. Coast is a 17-inch telescope housed within a 3.5 metre Barda Planetarium all-sky dome, whereas Pirate is slightly larger at 24 inches, housed within a similar but ever so slightly larger enclosure. Professional telescopes are normally located well away from population centres, in this case, part way up a volcano. This is so we can get away from things like light pollution from towns and cities. Being higher as well means we have less atmosphere to look through. So this means that the twinkling of stars caused by turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere is minimized. Due to the remote location of Pirate and Coast, we can't have someone here all the time monitoring and running the telescopes. That's why Pirate and Coast were developed to run completely autonomously. We are able to send the telescopes a schedule of observations to take throughout the night and the observatory control software ABOT, developed by Sevilla Technologies, enables the equipment to run this schedule throughout the night autonomously. The weather station here keeps an eye on the conditions at the observatory and the telescopes can then decide if the conditions become too difficult or dangerous to observe and if that's the case the domes will close and keep the equipment safe. Telescopes like Pirate and Coast use curved mirrors and glass lenses to focus the light from space down onto the camera sensor. In order to study the faintest and most distant objects, astronomers need as large an aperture as possible. The aperture is the light collecting area of the telescope. In the case of the design of Pirate and Coast, this is the mirror size. Pirate and Coast have mirrors of 0.6 and 0.4 metres whereas some of the largest ground-based optical telescopes in the world, currently in operation, have mirrors up to 10 metres in diameter. Some of the next generation, extremely large optical telescopes will even have mirrors up to 30 metres in diameter or larger.
Pirate and Coast study many different celestial objects, from long-term monitoring of variable stars, follow-up to alerts about gravitational wave detections and supernovae, to monitoring the dipping in a star's brightness as an exoplanet passes between us and the parent star. But I love to use Pirate and Coast to study asteroids, particularly the near-Earth asteroids. Near-Earth asteroids don't necessarily come close to Earth. They're categorised as those which, at their closest point to the Sun in their orbit, come less than 1.3 times the average distance between the Sun and the Earth. So if we take this rock as the Sun and draw Earth's orbit around it, then you could get an asteroid orbit that sits completely outside of Earth's orbit, or you can get one which crosses Earth's orbit as well. To give you an idea of what we can achieve with these telescopes, here I have a 3D printed model of the near-Earth asteroid 1999 AP10, which we constructed from data taken with the Pirate Telescope. However, you don't need to be a PhD student like me to use these telescopes. Access to Pirate is available through various undergraduate and postgraduate taught modules at the Open University. And access to COAST comes through our freely available badged open course, Astronomy with an Online Telescope, where you can request observations and contribute to a long-term stellar monitoring project, all from the comfort of your own home. We have many telescopes on our planet, looking out into space. Most are located at the top of mountains or in places far away from light pollution. But sometimes we put telescopes in space itself, launching them on rockets to escape the interfering effects of Earth and its atmosphere. One of these is the James Webb Space Telescope, or Webb for short, and it launched at the end of 2021. Webb is going to reveal the formation of the very first stars and galaxies. But Webb doesn't collect the light we see with our own eyes. Instead, it observes in the infrared, light at a different wavelength. This is because, although the very first stars to form emitted ultraviolet and visible light, they have been stretched by the expansion of the universe, meaning the light is received by us with longer infrared wavelengths, which renders them invisible to us. However, observing in the infrared allows Webb to see through the gas and dust clouds that stars form in. But if you want to look at the stars and can't get into space or find a volcano nearby, then just head away from street lighting and allow your eyes time to adjust to the dark. This will take about half an hour, then a whole galaxy of stars will be available to you. And if you have a chance, try visiting one of the International Dark Skies Reserves, where you will have the best chance to see the full glory of the night sky. Carol Haswell is Professor of Astrophysics at the Open University. She spent decades using telescopes, large and small, to study the stars above us. So I'm here on Exmoor, which was actually Europe's first International Dark Sky Reserve. And one of the reasons that we're here today is because there's a really beautiful array of planets um, arrayed along the southeastern sky. And so you can see up in the sky is Jupiter and also present in the sky, there's Saturn, Neptune, Uranus, uh, Mars, Venus and Mercury all arrayed in a line across the southeastern sky. So another really lovely target for a small telescope like this because it really is quite a dramatic sight and the best part of the moon to look at 
is always um, the division between the illuminated part of the moon and the dark part of the moon, and this is called the terminator. So small telescopes like this one are fabulous for actually looking at things with your own eyes, but increasingly um, for research, astronomers are putting telescopes in space above the Earth's atmosphere, which has a number of effects which reduce the quality of the observations that we can get. And so one of the biggest and best and newest of these space telescopes is the Webb Space Telescope. And the Webb Space Telescope is going to make all sorts of observations of different astronomical objects. And it's particularly been designed to look at light from the first stars and the first galaxies. But one of the things that interests me the most are the observations that it will make of hot, rocky exoplanets. So these are planets which are orbiting around other stars. And one of the things that we've learned over the last decade or so is that about 1% of stars like the Sun actually have rocky planets which are orbiting really close to the star. So some of these planets actually complete an entire circuit of the star within a single Earth day. So the year on some of these planets is one of our days long and they're orbiting so close to the star that they're almost within the stellar atmosphere as they orbit. And at that proximity, the planet gets heated to very high temperatures. So the surface of some of these planets reaches temperatures in excess of 2000 degrees. And if you have rock and you heat it to that temperature, it actually vaporizes. So these planets are actually vaporizing by the intense irradiation of their own sun. And by looking at the starlight, which has passed through this material, we're actually able to measure the chemical fingerprint of the constituent elements of that material. So this means that we're actually able to measure the geology of planets outside our own solar system. So identifying stars which host this sort of planet and finding the planets and looking into their geology is what I'm doing in my own research and I expect this to keep me busy for the next 10 years or so. And I hope to use the Webb Space Telescope to do some of this work. So I feel incredibly lucky because there's really never been a better time to be an astronomer. We have some fabulous large telescopes available, some amazing instrumentation that allows us to measure really detailed properties of light. And yeah, this is something that just keeps developing and we're learning more and more. But it's important to remember that all of this started with a small telescope used by Galileo. And these small telescopes allow us to collect more light than we can see with our own eyes. Mm -hmm.